from beginning of the third millennium, there is a decline in areas. All the young people do not really tend to go to STEM areas. They are going to social sciences, arts and humanities and things like that. But STEM areas, especially in Western world, does not do not attract um, young people. What are the reasons uh, for the decline uh, in the interest uh, of uh, these STEM areas? The curriculum is difficult. The curriculum is densely packed and inflexible. Other paths to good are easier. Engineering engineers treated as commodities by employers and traditional entry-level jobs are being offshore and media reports indi indicate instability. That's why young people do not tend to go to STEM areas. If you look at the, the this is general tendency, but if you look at the, the differences between girls and boys, there is a big difference. Uh, statistics consistently show that girls become disengaged from STEM subjects at school and are less likely to pursue a science-related degree at university, whereas there is no one single explanation for the low level of women in STEM and reasons may include just as follows. Lack of knowledge about STEM careers on the part of teachers in schools, lack of female role models, a high number of uh, precarious short-term contracts, unconscious bias on interviews and panels, uh, women being less likely than men to put themselves forward for senior positions, and also tendency for women to be steered into teaching and pastoral roles rather than research and academia. If you look at the percentages in STEM fields, the share of female students is smaller than male ones among bachelor's and master's students, about 32%. And uh, in the graduation, it goes up to 35%. And across all grades of academic staff, if you look at the academic staff, only 35% of the C grades, assistant professors, and the B grades, 28% of the uh, associate professors. And for A grades, full professors, only 19% of the full professors are female. If you look at the general picture, women are less likely to enter, more likely to leave STEM careers. Leave rates for women in science, engineering, and technology peak about 10 years into their careers. Work experiences impact women's decision to leave. And STEM fields have fewer women on boards than other industries. And women with technology experience may have an advantage in the boardroom, board rooms. There are two different kinds of uh, segregation, as you know, in gender equality, horizontal and vertical segregation impact negatively on women's academic career. Inequality is even more drastic at decision-making levels. Asymmetric distribution of research funding still persists among female and male researchers in many funding uh, systems. And um, excellence initiatives of various kind have not benefited male and female academics equally, and academic promotions still present specific difficulties rising from the lack of transparency in promotion processes and work and life balance issues. What are the barriers keeping girls and, girls and younger women to access the scientific and engineering education, how to encourage them to pursue a scientific career, how to retain them in STEM careers. Lack of female role models is very important because if there is no, um, no 
models for the students, then they do not have uh, any example what kind of life, what kind of working conditions they will be facing in, in, in their career. Learning about role models will allow them to feel that women and men are treated equally in STEM. Role models will break down the stereotypes, build self-confidence and motivation young, for young girls. Role models will encourage girls to get engaged with more STEM activities in real life. And role models can help girls to remove the boundaries in their dreams. Dear young people, there are lots of barriers uh, women uh, to enter uh, STEM areas. I would like to just list uh, several of them. Lack of transparency in recruitment and promotion processes. This is a very important issue. Even if you graduate from an engineering programs, when you uh, apply for jobs, then there is a you know, a uh, kind of bias that uh, the, the people uh, usually tend to accept uh, male uh, engineers rather than females. There are unequal access to research funding. The gap between work-life balance is very important because when uh, women get married, when they have children, they have a problem and it is very difficult for them to balance the work and life uh, together in order to have a you know a successful career they have also limited networking and visibility opportunities and there is also um, challenges for gender neutral awards limited mobility opportunity opportunities because of their work life balance Unconscious bias is creating serious problem, and there is a resistance there towards female uh, STEM uh, career uh, women. So what are the challenges? We need structural and institutional change. We need also cultural change. Otherwise, we cannot solve the problem. Leaders of higher education institutions play a crucial role in all change processes along with their leadership teams. Leaders can play even a change agent role at top level while integrating all the efforts coming from bottom-up decisions. We need leaders, men and women, who are ready to take the initiative for gender equality to create capacity or change in their institutions. As leaders, leadership team play important role in change processes. We decided to establish European Women Rectors Association. It's a full-fledged international non-profit association established in Brussels under the Belgian law in December 2015 to promote the role of women in leadership positions in the academic sector, to advocate gender equality in higher education and research at European and international scales. The founding board members are um, Carmen Fenol from Spain, Kristin Ingelsdotter from Iceland, Helena Nazare from Portugal, Ursula Neles from Germany, Gülsün Salame from Turkey, Kristina Ulenius from Sweden, and Krista Varantola from Finland. We are committed to address gender-based structural inequality with regard to academic leadership, and we invite you to join us by raising awareness, providing opportunities, encouraging and empowering women and academic uh, researchers for leadership positions and for STEM areas. Informing all stakeholders about the gender desegregated data for creating awareness, convincing leadership to give priority to achieving gender balance and take the action for making the necessary changes could be listed as some of the essential steps 
developing gender equality as one of the major priority areas in the institutions. Our aim is to make all of these uh, targets happen. So we have two important issues in this presentation. One is uh, the lack of representation of female students in STEM areas. The second one, lack of female leaders in academia. So that's why uh, European Women Rectors uh, Association focused on these two important issues and trying to make changes, structural changes, to, to be a facilitator in structural changes, cultural and cultural changes as well. Thank you. So if there is any question, I'm ready to answer. Okay, thank you very much, Kulsun. Uh, it's, it's a fact that we have many problems uh, in the university and other sectors, so this meeting is quite important so for the students can see and, and, and compare the, the women work duty situation and all the difficulties and problems that they may affront that they are bigger than men can find in their career. So if there is any question, you can type, you can talk, you can raise your hand. Don't be shy. Any question? May I add some more things about my own life? Just a short, uh, you know, additional information if there is no question. I am an architect. I dreamed to be an architect when I was nine years old. Yeah. <coughs> okay. One moment, they are typing. So, if there is no question, you can talk a little more about your career or if you prefer. Yeah, yeah, just a short information. Maybe uh, it may be helpful for. Uh, exactly. When, when you get your uh, architecture degree, when you uh, be elected as rector. Yeah, well. I will start, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, with uh, choosing the architecture. So uh, I, I decided to be an architect at a very young age. And I uh, was so lucky to enter Istanbul Technical University. In the Faculty of Architecture, only one third of the students were girls at that time. But it wasn't bad, really, that, uh, you know, ratio. So later, I uh, became the research assistant and did my PhD, and I became professor later. And there was no uh, plan in my, uh, you know, dreams to be the rector of the university. It happened so. I mean, it's a, a long story. Let's make it short. And uh, I became the first and only female rector of. Istanbul Technical University in its 250 years history. So that is that is something very unique. Although I employed lots of uh, women at top management during my rectorship, but unfortunately we were not able to get another female rector in my university. So 
That's the case. Okay, thank you, Gulshun. Okay, uh, the most of the students are from Spain and Italy, and I know <laughs> that we are people very shy talking English. We always think that our English is quite bad. So when we travel abroad, <laughs> we find <laughs> that uh, other foreign people have the same problem with the English language. So we invite you to type any question. Gulshun is one of the most important figures in the architecture nowadays. And he's a quite important professor and um, his career in the Istanbul University and Karim Has University is very important. So she's part of the uh, exhibition that we prepared the last year and this one is still ready for your high school and every city to to ask for it and we can send it to you. Carlos, would it be possible to ask the students to raise their hands, especially girls who would like to go into STEM areas? <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, high school, can you hear me? Press your hand if you can hear it. Okay. So one of which one of yours wanna do a STEAM career? as mathematics, biology, chemistry, architecture, engineering. You see, so we need oh. more young people to be engaged in STEM areas because world need, needs them. Yes. Yeah, in, in Spain, in the last year, we have the same problem. Yes. Only the biology and medicine career are growing. The other science or STEAM careers are decreasing. When you go to, you know, United States or UK, you can see that all Chinese Indian students are in STEM areas, mm -hmm. but not the Europeans. No, uh, I don't have a problem with history, but uh, <laughs> I think uh, STEAM areas are quite important too, so we need to promote it yeah. between young people and especially women. Yes. Because it's always this gap between uh, these careers are only for men. No, 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 no. Women are reaching great <coughs> achievements, great discoverments, and they are. Um, we need with more problems than a, than a man has in his career. So we invite you to to oh, okay um, <coughs> to apply to technical careers, STEM careers, science careers, because the the society progress with the science. Okay, so we are going to following. We are thank you, Gulsum. It's, it's a pleasure to, to hear you. Um, we are going <coughs> with the next one. It's Laura Frutos. She's from Spain. She's biochemist. She's a biochemist, and she's now in in the Neuroscience Institute. Is uh, a center part of the Spanish Superior Council of Research. And she's going to talk and share all the details about her career and her research nowadays. Thank you, Lara. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I will try to share my. Okay. Okay, please uh, tell me if you can see it. Can you see the presentation? I cannot see you, so please, if anyone can tell me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, well, um, they've already presented me, but again, I'm Laura Frutas, and today I'm going to talk to you about my own scientific um, experience. 
So my journey into science started very early in my life because my first scientific model was my own mother. So she is um, Maria Jose Frutas Fernandez. She is professor at the Agrofood Technology Department in Universidad Miguel Hernandez at, and also member of the uh, expert panel in EFSA and FAO. Oh, well, so I remember having scientific conversations with her, also doing small experiments at home. So yeah, very early in my life. But at some point I had to grow up and then uh, start my own scientific uh, path, let's say. So, well, my journey into science has been a path full of women, uh, contrary to uh, the case of my colleagues, but yeah. So I studied uh, the bachelor's degree in biochemistry in Universidad de Murcia in the southeast of Spain. Uh, well, there I met who will be my next, let's say, scientific um, model of inspiration, who was Dr. Maria Teresa de Diego. She was also later the director of my final uh, degree project. Uh, well, during my degree, I worked during two years in the biochemistry department. And there I was studying different things about uh, Escherichia coli bacteria proteins. And I was very happy doing, you know, these specifically uh, biochemist, um, biochemistry experiments and so on. But at some point, I felt that I needed to apply all my uh, knowledge in biochemistry into a more unknown field, let's say. So I decided uh, to do my master in neuroscience in uh, Universidad Miguel Hernández in Alicante. And during my master, I get a collaboration grant from the Spanish Ministry of Education and Exports in the physiology department of the university. And there I met my two new uh, models, uh, female researchers that were Dr. Juana Gallar and Dr. Mari, Mari Carmen Acosta who were also later the directors of my master final uh, project. So when I finished my master, they asked me if I wanted to stay in their lab for doing my doctoral thesis. So I agree. And from uh, 2016 until now, I'm part of the PhD program in neuroscience in Universidad Miguel Hernández, and I work in the Ocular Neurobiology Group in the Instituto de Neurociencia. So during my first years of PhD, I get a Generalitat Valenciana predoctoral research grant. And uh, well, in the last years, I've been hired with different uh, contracts to uh, continue with my research. So during my PhD, I've also uh, done two different research studies. The first ones in, uh, was in the Tufts Medical Center in Boston uh, under the direction of Dr. Pedro Hamra. And the other one was in the, uh, in the Institut de la Vision uh, in Paris under the direction of Dr. Annabel Gaud. So this lab was also uh, performed uh, with a Generalitat Valenciana Mobility Grant. And well, uh, the path continues and in the future when I finish my PhD, which will happen in almost a month, I will start my postdoc in New Shopping University in Sweden under the direction of Dr. Neil Lagali. So as you can see, uh, in seven years, I've been in more than four labs. I've worked in more than four research projects. I've got three different competitive grants and I've been hired with three different contracts. So my take home message for you is that in science, you have to be prepared for many changes, changes in your projects, changes in your city, changes uh, in your, you know, uh, work conditions. Science is change, for sure. But is there a life beyond the lab? And the answer is yes. One of the most, for me, enriching things about science uh, is uh, conferences. In conferences, you can present your research in front of different experts and yeah, they give feedback to you and you can discuss yeah, about your results. You can also learn a lot of things from experts because there are many different talks. So it's, it's a, I mean, I love uh, congresses. They are a great experience and they offer you also the opportunity to again, visit different countries and well for sure to meet great people with whom you can have a great time outside the conference too 
So in in my case, my take home message also for you, future researchers, is that knowing languages in science is crucial, especially English. Even if your English is not perfect, mine is not perfect, but you have to, you know, have like a basic knowledge in, in languages, especially English, because the official language in, in science is English, and you will need it to communicate your research and for sure to communicate uh, with people, right? So this is my take home message to you. And well, there is also a uh, science outreach events. Uh, this is my favorite part uh, of science. Some of them are aimed, uh, aimed uh, to children, but also, yeah, for adults. So my deco message is just telling society about science is as important as doing it. It makes no sense to be in, your, in the lab doing your research and that's all. No, you have to tell people what are you doing? Why are you doing that? And explain people or their doubts because a problem with science uh, is because society really don't know what science uh, do, right? And last but not least, uh, there is teaching. I've taught in many degrees as pharmacy, psychology, biotechnology, environmental science. And as in my experience, first as a student and later as teacher, was that you have to share your knowledge for sure with your students, but also you have to generate curiosity and awareness between them. Because in science, you will need it in the future. So this is my story, uh, but what is my research about? Well, as I already told you, I'm part of the Ocular Neurobiology Group in the Instituto de Neurociencias, and I'm studying um, corneal sensory innervation and neuroimmunity. Okay, the sensory innervation of the cornea. Okay, but where is the cornea? The cornea is the transparent part of the eye that is in front of the iris and the pupil. It uh, functions as a window for the eye, let's say. It has to be uh, transparent, it has not to be dirty, it hasn't to be broken because if not, you cannot see properly through it, right? So the cornea has to be also healthy and, you know, clean to have a proper sight. So there are many different factors that contribute to the uh, corneal's health. Uh, one of the most uh, important warriors, let's say, uh, are corneal sensory neurons. Sensory neurons are the cells of the nervous system that encode and transmit information about temperature, pain, and touch. And you can say me, okay, Laura, but do we really need uh, perception about temperature or touch in the eye? The answer is yes. And indeed, the cornea is the most densely innervated tissue in the human body because uh, these nerves that I will explain to you now, uh, they, they are different types of nerves, but all these nerves contribute to different ocular physiological processes that are intended to protect the ocular surface. And the most important ones are tearing and blinking. For sure, ever in your life, you have... Mm, I don't know, any pain in the eye. And, you know, the, the first reaction is, you know, you in increase your tearing and start to blink a lot. This is because these kind of neurons are responding and telling our brain that we need to tear more or blink more just to protect the ocular surface. So there are different types of sensory neurons that are classified according to the modality of a stimulus by which they are activated. We have polymodal nociceptors that respond to mechanical stimulation, heat, and chemicals, and they are responsible for injury and inflammatory pain. Uh, well, I'm sure that ever in your life, uh, having a shower, you have uh, uh, shampoo in your eyes, and this is a very painful experience. So the neurons responsible for that pain you experience when you have shampoo in your eyes are these polymodal nociceptor neurons. Um, Mechanonociceptors respond to mechanical stimulations and they are responsible for uh, foreign body pain. These neurons are responsible for the sensation we have when, uh, when a speck of, of dust is in our eye or sand or whatever in our eye. These uh, are the neurons that uh, start to respond to these stimuli. And finally, we have colchemal receptors that respond to temperature decreases and they are responsible for conscious sensations of dryness and freshness. These are the neurons responsible for this uncomfortable sensation in the eye when we spend a lot of time in front of the computer or in front of our Nintendo Switch or whatever. That's part uncomfortable feeling in our eyes when we spend many hours in front of a screen. That's, uh, these are the neurons responsible for that sensation. So they are very, very important for ocular surface physiology. 
And the other barrier are, is the immune system and particularly dendritic cells. Dendritic cells are a very important type of immune cells for the role in both innate and adaptive immune responses. And it has been shown that there is a large presence of these cells in the cornea. So under inflammatory and pathological conditions, when there is a disease in the eye or wherever, there's a, a functional interaction between these dendritic cells and these corneal sensory nerves. Dendritic cells release substances that act on the nerves, and these uh, sensory nerves release some substances that act on dendritic cells. But what I want to know, my particular research, is about um, showing if there's also a functional neuroimmune interactions between dendritic cells and corneal nerves, but without inflammation or injury at basal conditions. So this is uh, what is my research about. So to answer that question, I use different techniques. For example, uh, by using uh, microscopy, here you can see the cornea of a mouse in which dendritic cells are in green and, the, and corneal sensory nerves are in, re in red, right? So by using my microscopy, I can study if there are morphological interactions between corneal sensory nerves and dendritic cells, for example. Also, by using electrophysiological recordings, uh, I can even record the activity of the corneal neurons because neurons communicate with each other by uh, electrical signals. Uh, so I can record those electrical signals of the neurons in my experiments, and I can see if the nerve activity changes or not in different conditions. And finally, by using mice, I can also uh, do behavioral experiments and see and measure, for example, the tearing rate in mice. This technique is the same as using in humans, for example. And I can also measure if there is pain in the mice. So, yeah, this is more or less the technique I use to answer my question. And if you have any doubts uh, about them or about my research, I can answer you now in the in the questions and answer part but for now uh, that's all i wanted to tell you so thank you very much uh, you all for your attention and i hope you like it thank you impressive <laughs> thank you okay what do you think okay maybe some people are <laughs> clapping <laughs> okay if you have any question is the moment, it's your time, don't be shy. Uh, because you, you can think that mm, this mm, kind of research or fact achievement are science fiction, uh, so hard to, to guess or to get. <clears throat> but if you work hard, you can do a great work in science too. Science is not a, a impossible matter. So they are here to show you that you can be an important part of the science. Okay, yeah, we, we have to get one hour. Okay, uh, then Han, do you, do you want to make one question? No? Sure. Maybe I can put uh, my email address, or if not, if any one of the students want to, I don't know, ask me something or whatever, I don't mind. So I will put it in the chat in case anyone has to contact me. Okay, you can send out your question. Let's see your beautiful English, come on. I have a student, she's Maria, she's going to ask a question. Come here, the microphone, yeah, sorry. We don't have a microphone, so she has to come next to the computer. Okay, you can type it. Yeah, she can hear you from here. Okay. Um, Laura is setting in. The camera is up. You can. Ask. Yes, go ahead, don't be shy. Were did you study um, psychology? No. So, no, biochemistry. Ah, biochemistry, sorry. <laughs> biochemistry, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. 
Oh, no. Oh. Could you hear my question? I think so. Have you, did you hear? Yeah. Okay. So the question was, as well, did you study biochemistry? Because you couldn't, oh, we didn't hear. I studied biochemistry where? Yes, yes, where? In, in Murcia. Ah, in the UCAM? No. No, in, in Universidad de Murcia. Oh, that's good. That's the University of Murcia. Murcia. Ah, okay. Yeah. I'm from Murcia, indeed. <laughs> I think there are some high schools here from Murcia. I heard that's a lovely city. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, it is. Indeed, it is. Okay, any other question? Hey, there, there you have my email, just... Uh, Perfect. So, we can um, keep the meeting with me and Sarah. Thank you very much. She, she has finished one appointment faster. We had a very problem with the hours gap between Turkey and Spain. Um, she is a system professor in Mechatechnics Engineering at Cadillac University. Um, she has visited many countries. Uh, she has completed or reached his PhD in Italy and she has made part of her career and research in Spain at the University of Juan Carlos I. It's so famous now for very bad issues, but I ensure that she gets a very great work there. So thank you, Mine for staying here with us, and um, it's your turn. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks for the uh, introduction, and that was a very nice pronunciation of my name. That's why I like the Mediterranean countries. In the States, I generally get mine. That's pretty um, annoying, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, but yeah, it's a good, present it's a good uh, pronunciation. So um, I'm sharing my screen. I hope you can see it. You cannot now. Uh, hold on. Right. OK. Um, can everyone see my slides? I hope yes. Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Laura. Uh, so this is Mina Sarach Stroppa. I'm an assistant professor at Kudirhaus University under the Department of Mechatronics Engineering. I assume most of you don't know what is the mechatronics engineering, but basically what we do is robots. Obviously, when I say robots, these are the images that probably comes to your mind. So it's either these kind of humanoids that do um, pretty human-like activities or these kind of industrial robots where uh, they're located at the factories and they just perform very hardcore tasks that we cannot do as humans. But then here's the thing. With the technology getting better and better, we start using these robots to interact with us. We can see more and more robots that we couldn't see maybe 20 years ago, and we want to use them a lot more now with the current technology. But still, it's a very hot topic to understand how to make these interactions between the humans and robots. And just like you can see in these videos, Things can go really wrong when we're trying to force robots to interact with us. So in order to overcome these things and to create a new use for these robots, my research is about understanding the haptics. That's why actually I'm super glad Laura started with the perception and the brain, uh, brain functionality around this sense of touch. But, um, and I think I want you students to do one exercise with me. So you understand what is the hand, 
uh, the sense of touch and what is haptics. So now I want you to raise all of you your right arm on top of your head. Right. Don't touch your head. Just let it fly on the, let your finger fly on your, above your head, okay? And now raise your left arm and make your fingertips touch. Touch them. So Laura can see her image, but I assume most of you students can't really see what you're doing, right? And I ask you to perform a very simple task. You can um, relax now. Thank you. I ask you to perform a very simple task that we can perform using our arms and our hands without using any other information from our other senses. I assume you weren't able to see what you were doing, but still you could know how high your right arm is, how high your left arm is, and when exactly you touched your fingertips. So we can perform stuff like this basically because our bodies can process the sense of touch in two alternative modalities, right? The first one is called the kinesthetic, which is a lot related to me knowing where my arm is and how I can move my arm around my body. And then the other information is more tactile, which is more related to the sensation or the texture around my skin that can be related to texture, to the temperature or to the forces. So what I do around these things or what is there that connects the sense of touch to the robotics is actually haptic devices. So we can create either devices that you can wear or you can touch and you can move these robotic devices until you actually come across to some resistance that might create a feeling for you. Or alternatively, we can create these tactile sensations, just like you have the vibration property of your cell phones, or just like the new PlayStation 5 game pads that creates a vibration every time you're exploring a different surface and you would feel the difference between different surfaces. And this is pretty much what I do. So in my research, I try to develop different robotic devices. Oh, sorry for the Turkish title. Um, I'm trying to create these robotic devices that the humans can wear or the humans can touch that would create different sensations for the humans. So here is my a little bit background on me and my research. I started my education in Turkey, in Istanbul, under electrical and electronics engineering. And when I started this, I actually didn't want to be an engineer because I was like, I'm a little girl, what am I supposed to do with a bunch of engineers? And this kept going for another maybe three years until I actually met a very nice, um, sweet lady professor. And she brought me into this concept of robotics and control systems. And I was hooked. And right then and there, I decided that I wanted to be her. So I decided to continue my path with the robots and to become an academician. So in my uh, dissertation for my bachelor degree, I actually worked with this giant robot that you can see that we built and we controlled so that it could create a physical assistance for the patients with stroke. So for those patients who couldn't move their arms, these robotic devices would create these movements for them so that they can learn these new tasks, um, even if they have certain impairments. Then I started my master's degree in mechatronics that kind of combines this electronic concept with the rest of the mechanics. 
And over here, I created this mobile device from scratch and I controlled it that would move, uh, that could perform all these planar movements. It can move in straight uh, lines or it can turn to create again, the sort of uh, movement for the same sort of people who cannot move their arms. And in fact, we then uh, implemented this super cool technology that we call brain computer interaction. So we were trying to detect whenever the, the, the users wanted to move their arms and how hard did they want to move their arms. So as a respond, we were controlling the velocity of this robot. So if you focus too hard, then your arm moves a lot. So it was a good um, control technology that we were using for um, the physical therapy. And then I moved to Italy um, to uh, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna uh, to complete my PhD in perceptual robotics. And when I was there, I moved to Universidad de Juan Carlos. I don't know if I pronounced it well um, to perform some of yeah, my very well. Yeah, very well. Yay. Uh, some of these activities also in Spain. So over here, what I did was to, to design again from scratch um, this giant robotic glow that was creating this assistance for the user to grasp different objects without changing anything in the control strategy. So you can just wear the device and grasp whatever you want. Uh, and this was especially done for those people who cannot move um, their hands. And when I moved to Spain, then we thought, well, we have a pretty good glow. Why don't we extend it to the virtual reality? So then the basic idea was that you can see an object at any shape and at any size in a virtual reality, completely on control on, on the computer. And basically by providing the control for this glow, you could feel when and how you are interacting with this virtual um, object, which doesn't exist in real life so that we can create one step further of sensory information that could be potentially very useful for um, the future of gaming or any type of computer interaction. And basically these activities uh, brought me a postdoctoral um, position at Stanford University. So I moved to um, the States which is actually an interesting pattern um, since also Laura was mentioning that. The research is about changing, the research is about traveling. And I think considering that we're um, organizing this Mediterranean researchers um, talk, I think I am a good Mediterranean researcher, except the state's um, detail over here. So at Stanford, um, I was again designing this robot that was, um, well, you could wear it on your wrist and just like a Fitbit, but it provides a force feedback. So it was squeezing you compared to your activities with the virtual environments. Um, so the more you squeeze a virtual object, then the stronger squeeze you would feel on your wrist. And we, I was basically working for this project that was funded by Facebook Reality Labs and um, also the defense, uh, the Department of Defense that could be used for some military applications. And I worked there for like three years. It was great. But then I moved to um, Turkey as an assistant professor at Kadir Has University, which I'm very happy to be back to Europe after three years in the States. So here I have been teaching, but also I am doing a lot of research. So um, in the past one year, I actually created this um, haptics laboratory in which we are expanding what I started during my previous education. And now I have a 
group of um, undergraduate and graduate students who are working very hard to follow what I have been doing and they're helping me a lot. And we are very happy to create new robots in my lab. But also I have another lab in which we are creating all these um, softwares in the virtual environment that could bring new interaction scenarios that brings us closer to interacting with the computers in the future. And I think this is the end of my talk. If I have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank, thank you very much, Mine. Quite impressive. Uh, so many solutions, applications. Um, I'm impressed. Both of you are, are great researchers, and we are so happy and glad with the results of this meeting. Because um, reading your description and definition, I can never imagine all you are doing. So that's your turn. Uh, sorry, may I ask a question? Please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can ask. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a teacher here. So my question would be, it's very simple, simple plus kind of these prototypes that you make in the lab, like how long do you think that you need as a development so that they can be uh, actually used for the general public, like these prototypes you do? Right. So you mean like how long it takes in terms of time to start working on it and to yeah. create as a prototype or as a device in the market? A device in the market like these prototypes you do to help people which have like the stroke and they can't use their hands. So how long do you think that these prototypes, how much time of development you need? Actually a lot. So um, even from like... In terms of developing them in the lab, it actually requires a lot of design and a lot of loops that we make them and then there is an error, so we remake it and there comes another thing, so we go back to the beginning. So, and I can say approximately about three to four years before we actually start offering these devices to the clinical studies. And then there comes another four years in which we do some um, actual clinic studies with the patients and under the, um, under the pack of these different therapists so that we can actually claim and we can talk about the numbers, how easy does this device make it for these therapies. So I would say approximately at least 10 years, which is actually a lot. Well, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? Now, a few chambers, it's your time. You can. <laughs> From Italy, anyone? Um, I can also write my email as well if it's um, going to be more comfortable. Keep in touch. To keep in touch, I can get some uh, questions. In Italian from Italy, but from Spain, I don't think that I can respond in Spanish. I can try. Yeah, your Spanish is quite well or not? Um, no, when I was in Spain, I was speaking in Italian and people were speaking Spanish to me and we had a connection. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lovely, many Mediterranean languages in connection. Okay, so... If there isn't any other question, we are so happy. Thank you, Mine, Laura, for your intervention. 
thank you high school students for your patience um, <laughs> I'm waiting for this the problem we are solving many problems at the beginning so thank you very much I hope this meeting will be uh, great for you you will appreciate and you will get any inspiration or information that will help you to get your future career so it was a pleasure see you and thank you very much bye guys bye everyone <laughs> bye